Hello, everyone. We're back. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention when I talked about the cheaper by the dozen family, the Gilbreths, uh, the whole point of that story was that they lived in Montclair. So it was bringing a Montclair connection. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, in this portion, uh, we're going to hear wonderful pianist. She used to be my student, and she's now a colleague and works at the Cali School of Music. She teaches in the Extension Division, Shishuen Zhang, and she's uh, also a very busy collaborative pianist with the college students. So please say hello to Shishuen Zhang. Hi. Shishuen is going to perform the F minor nocturne of Chopin, and then we'll talk about it.
Joanne, it's very beautiful. Very beautiful performance. Thank you. Um, please, please notice something about the way Chopin wrote the opening uh, and think about the scale, the F minor scale, which, you know, all melodies want to arrive at the bottom. They want to go five, four, three, two, one. So the goal of any music, any scale like that, is to get back to one, back to the bottom, in this case, F. Uh, the, the royal road back, of course, is five. So, uh, now, this melody has that unusual feature of arriving on five, but then is very reluctant to leave. It's almost as if he wanted to write this. And just kind of sadly remains on five and kind of gets stuck there. Also notice the piece begins on five, but not on the downbeat. Imagine if Chopin had written this. Like right away, three, four, one. Okay, why do you think Chopin wrote that five, that C, a beat early? It's like pay attention. I let everyone to think, oh, what will go on next? And then. Yeah. And you play that very well, like a question mark, like there's silence, silence. Silence and then, and it's suspended over the bar line. And then by the second measure, we realize how important that C is, and he won't let go of it. He just keeps going. Of course, he ornaments it with note below, and then, and the second time you hear it, that repetition little area, he does something that Scarlatti made a career out of. Remember, instead of just the sigh mode of Scarlatti would add a little sob to the sigh. So you really feel the tears starting to come. Right? Uh, so he's, it's very introverted type of melody. He's very reluctant to continue the journey down to one. He really gets stuck on that five. Um, why don't you play it? Play again the first uh, four or five measures, thinking about how special, poignant that is, and how sad that repetition of the five is. Sure. <laughs> And you're you're feeling this now. I would suggest, especially since this hour is supposed to be at shape, talking about shape. I think there is a way to shape with your forearm to create the diminuendo that will make it even more poignant. Let me show you. Instead of um, instead of saying staying in one area, why don't you approach this and then start going up? I'm kind of doing a forward shift, almost like I'm going to leave the keyboard. That automatically gives me a what? A diminuendo. Listen. And the next time I go to the first C. So even if you're a little nervous and your your wrist might shake a little bit, the larger movement, the larger forward shift, the larger movement up will automatically give you a diminuendo and make the shape more beautiful. I'll try. Right. Sorry. No, so you, went, you went up too soon. You went, you're already too high. Stay, look, stay rather flat and now. I think you do just the right hand. That's getting. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about timing out, timing how long you have to do that. You know, if you go up too soon, there's nothing left. 
It's like the guy in Wizard of Oz when the wizard's ready to take Dorothy home, and he's already above, and he can't get back. He doesn't know how to control this thing. So, on the other hand, you don't want to stay. You don't want to stay flat too long. You want to. Once again. Okay, I think that was your best one. <laughs> yeah. But that's something to think about. Um, do you have measure numbers? Yes. Why don't you jump to measure 40, measure 40 when the theme comes back, but it's ornamented this time. Sure. the first time we see a really true Chopin-esque ornamentation when he's going. So he's creating three almost separate phrases. One of them is followed by, followed by. Okay, each one has a shape that is a curve. Uh, it's a counter, I'm sorry, it's a clock. Um, Counterclockwise curve, like. See what I'm doing? Right. Yeah, and that itself, those four notes you played were more beautiful than you've ever done it. Because they were connected with a shape. Once again, just those four notes. Yeah. So you want to go to the right, up, and over. And the next group is, um, you start on the left, come toward the right, but almost scraping the bottom of the circle. That's right. Now, because there's a third phrase, the fingering has to be, again, very Chopin-esque, where you switch to five right there. Can you see? Three, five, four, five. Chopin was the first one that we know about who would not be afraid to make his fifth finger either go above the other fingers or below the other fingers. In the shape of the That's it. And the third phrase is a little bit quicker. And again, you have that sob on, on top of the side. Yeah, you went up a little too high. That's it. Now you have three beautiful curves, curvilinear motion. Just string them all together, okay, from here. It's really nice. Do you have the courage to put it together with the left hand? Sure. Exactly that space. Play. Yeah. I would say that's the best I've heard you play it, that little place. Okay. Now, because of the time limitation, uh, I suggest we jump to the very last page. Okay, check, look at measure 89 on the very last page. It's when finally he's flipped away from F minor and he's doing um, what we sometimes call a Picardy third. He's ending a minor key piece in the major, right? Can you play from right there, measure 89?
Okay, the, the timing is very good. Um, I have one suggestion about playing the uh, broken chords. I would suggest uh, an under wave. So you come, imagine that you're, look, I'm putting my other hand, I'm making sure that I'm like the bottom of a soft boiled egg. When you take a soft boiled egg and you set it on the table, instead of a pure oval, the bottom gets flattened out. So, but you still feel like you're going across. Can you do that movement? That's right. So then the inner notes of the triplet have just the right amount of, of scoop. It's like a scoop, scooping up, scooping up. Try like that. Right, now those are all fine. They're little grouplets of triplets. Now just connect them, as Chopin did, with two little notes. Yeah, so it's much better. You feel the shape and the grouping. Um, now, the, the real consideration is what happens in the left hand. Look at measure 89. Listen. Sorry. Chopin asks for a what? Crescendo. Oh, you mean right hand? Yeah. 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 So you make a crescendo for a little while, but then at the end of measure 90, he asks for a what? Uh, diminuendo and then also accelerando. Yes, yeah, or accelerando. Yeah. So, can you try that? Start rather softly at measure 89. Start softly and then make a move to crescendo, but then change your mind, as Chopin did and then diminuendo, and then as you get quicker, get softer. That's the challenge. Sorry, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about getting so fast. I know it's a cello rondo. But I don't. Th I think we still need to hear takati 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 ta, takati takati ta. If you go takati takati takati, and then we don't hear the kati ta, the articulation of it. Yes. Yeah. That was nice. And of course, on Zoom, on the Zoom system, we can't really hear how your pedaling is and the, you know, the ambient sound in the room. We're not really sure. But once you get to F major, you know, don't change the pedal. Just keep it all one pedal. Um, and then to end the piece, what do you notice about the next melody note on that next solid chord? We finally have a solid chord. What do you notice about the melody note? What degree of the scale is it? Uh, six to five. Flat six. Yes. Flat six. And that's Chopin's favorite interval, six or flat six, to prepare, to prepare the final ending. Um, but for the last, uh, you know, 15 measures, He's been, he's flipped to the Picardy third, as I mentioned. He's been in F major, but suddenly he reminds you, this is supposed to be a sad, heartbreaking piece. And he brings back the minor, the minor six. And then he says, Mo, let's smile through the tears anyway, in F major. So in that one ending, you have both minor and then major. 
it's presented with a diminuendo. You see? But then Forte, he's he wants to confirm life now. So the moods change very, very quickly. Uh, why don't you play from near... Um, end it and then surprise us with the, his ending, featuring the flat six and then the, the raised normal third, as, as I just talked about. Take it. Yes, beautiful. I think you're capturing the whole meaning of this piece very, very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And um, I'm going to unmute everyone to see if you have any questions. We'll be glad to answer questions. Let me just figure out how to unmute folks. <laughs> Oh my. Now. <laughs> wow. I have a question. Yes, please. Identify yourself. My name is Justin Cole. Yes, Justin. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank okay. you. Um, you probably would like to have a question with more specificity, but I am curious as to your answer since you play both of the, the music of both composers uh, quite well, wonderfully well. What is the difference you have to leave the meeting. between Liszt and Chopin's piano music? The difference, you mean how I'm it's yours. written? <laughs> no, I mean, <clears throat> these two men looked at things differently in many ways, and they're both wonderful. They're both, they were both masters. Well, they did have different evolutions. Like Chopin, by the time he was 19, he was fully formed and wrote some of his most beautiful music and continued to write in the beautiful style. Liszt uh, became more interested in virtuosity and showing off when he was in his early 20s. Uh, and then by the time he was in his 40s, he became more sober and scaled down the playing and became allowed his religious side to come out. In fact, in the last 15 years of his music, uh, it's not showing off at all. It becomes very spiritual. But I'm not sure if that's the kind of answer you were expecting. No, but it's uh, great information. Um, <clears throat> is not Liszt's music more orchestral? His uh, piano music. That's an interesting point. Yes, um, when people try to orchestrate Chopin's music, it's usually a failure. There is that famous bala um, ballet, I think it's called Les Sophides, which is com composed of five or six well-known Chopin piano works, but it's, trans it's transcribed for orchestra. And as beautiful as it is, you really miss hearing the piano instead of the orchestra. Whereas Liszt, Liszt um, was always going back and forth. He, he would orchestrate uh, his tone poems. He would arrange them for piano. He would go back and forth. Um, so that's what I would say about that. <laughs> and you said it well. Well, thank you very much. And congratulations on uh, this entire series. Uh, once thank again, you, Justin. Your, thank annual, you. your annual gig of Dorothy Taubman. Bravissimo. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Joanne. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This was wonderful. 
and I wondered if we could watch it again, like offline or something, because there's so much information packed in it. I would love to see it again, you know, and I noticed it says recording. Yes, um, we will be able to make it available. I don't know if it'll be a limited basis or um, by special request. We're not sure about that, but send me an email about this request, okay? I will. Thank you, you, you so can always much. send email. If you don't have my personal email, you can always reach me at talbin88 at aol.com. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your enthusiasm. No, anyone else absolutely. have anyone else have a question or a comment? Yeah, yeah, I have a question, uh, uh, Doctor Doctor uh, Witten. Is this um, Dexter? Yeah, this is Dexter. Um, so I, I had a I had a lesson recently with uh, Edna uh, Galansky. Yes. And mm. one of the main details was she wanted the wrist to be a little more up in order for the weight of the arm to go into the keyboard. But I, I see different practitioners of, of the Talman approach that, that has a lower wrist sometimes. So I, I just wonder um, how, I mean, is, is is that followed strictly or uh, it, you, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, the point of it, your, your hand, your wrist, your arm should be acting as a unit and to make them, to let them act as a unit, first of all, when you sit down, you have to make sure your elbow is pretty much on the level of the white keys. And, and once you're in that situation, uh, like if you're rotating, your arm is working as a unit you, you don't have to worry so much if your wrist is a little lower or a little higher. Important thing is you don't want extreme range, like you don't want to drop your wrist and you don't want to raise it so much. Uh, so it's a reasonable amount. Okay. You remember how when cars, before they had power steering on all the cars, and if you turn the wheel completely to the left, it would start to squeak and squeal? Ah. Uh. That's, I don't that's know. a good analogy. Yeah. So you don't want that squealing and complaining feeling. You don't want to be at the extreme range of motion. Yeah. You want it to be reasonably uh, one unit. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think uh, Otto Ortmann in, in the uh, a book that you quoted, I think he mentions that to avoid uh, those uh, extremities of, of, of the wrist joint. Uh, I have a second question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I'm writing a paper on Claudio Rao, uh, mm -hmm. Claudio Rao's fingerings for addition Peters. Are, are you familiar with, with those? And, and I was thinking that the Jacob, the Jacob Hellman might be a good source to quote. Um, but Claudio Rao never met uh, Hellman, as far as I know. What? Well, well it, no, no, it, it, that's that's accurate. What, what I'm trying to do is explore Arouse fingerings and and how uh, there's a lot of technical and and uh, musical discovery that can be gleaned from his uh, idiosyncratic fingerings um, because the fingering sort of suggests a, a really unique way of approaching the piano and. Uh, it, it relates to the, you know, curvilinear and, and his whole technical philosophy. But I was just wondering, were you, are you familiar with his avoidance of the fourth finger and, and playing chords with five, two, one, and uh, et cetera? Are you talking about Claudio Arau's fingering? Yes, yes, they're oh. highly un unusual, but I think there's a lot that one could, could get from it. Oh, I must confess, I haven't seen Aral's book. I know he edited Beethoven, um, but I must confess I'm not knowledgeable about it. I know that Aral studied with Martin Krause in Berlin when he was a young man, and Krause was the same teacher uh, of also Manuel Ponce, the Mexican, wonderful Mexican composer. But be interested to see your work when it's finished. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Witt, my question is on the edition we should use. When we're studying Chopin Nocturne, should we continue to use Pararevsky, or would you suggest something else, depending upon ballad, nocturne, waltz, whatever? Well, the important thing about the Pararevsky edition 
is you have to remember in the back, the final 10 or 12 pages has a lot of important notes. People uh -huh. often forget that they're there, but that's where you see a discussion of the editors when they made their decisions. Mm -hmm. See, Chopin published all his works uh, simultaneously <clears throat> in three different countries, and he had to write it out by hand or have a friend write it out by hand. So each time he wrote it out, he'd say, oh, I think this would be better, and he would add a little triplet or something that was not in the first time. So the three, the three different editions are all slightly different. When the Paderewski group met to publish those works for the for the uh, 100th anniversary of his Yurtzeit, uh, they had to make decisions which ones they would choose. The good news is, as I said in the back, you see an explanation of why they chose as they did. Now, as far as Chopin editions, I personally prefer the Mikuli edition simply because of the fingerings. I really love Carl Mikuli's fingerings and it feels very comfortable in my hand. And remember, Mikuli studied for a number of years with Chopin, and and then later, after Chopin's death, Mikuli did edit and publish complete works. So that's that's my personal preference. Oh, thank you. Sure, Mikuli <laughs> is found in Shermer. That's one of the few times it's nice to buy Shermer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Whitman. Yes. Angelica Plas here from New Mexico. Um, I teach little children, uh, teach Suzuki piano, and um, I just wanted to know your um, comment on, on the way I'm teaching um, rotation little kids. And I asked them to put their hand up like this and, and, um, and make this movement. And then also to pretend that they are looking at themselves in the mirror and then showing me their mirror. What do you think of that? Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, but, and here, to go a little bit further with that, listen, can you see me? Yes. I, I like the way you hold it up, but then you can lower it, lower it like this, and then you look over to your left and say, oh, there's a piano. And then you keep moving and suddenly your hand is on the piano. Oh, there it is. And you just move over. <laughs> that would be so it sounds like you're entirely in the going in the right direction thank you any uh, other question folks yes Dr. Whedon, I have a question about um, octave like fast octave um, yes do you do you move your forearm a lot like uh, for example list rhapsody number six do you have a lot of up down motion or or less, less motion. How do you move? Can you show an example? Well, first of all, I guide with the thumb. When I practice octaves, sometimes I do thumb only and just keep my hand in a normal open position and play the thumb. If the thumb needs to go to the black note, I aim for it a little bit early. Can you demonstrate a little bit? I'm not sure if you all can see me. I'll try. Okay. We're talking about this. Um, that one? Yeah. I would practice thumb. And slowly, like, as soon as I play the A, I'm instantly on the B flat. You don't even see me moving. So suddenly I'm there. Then the day before the concert, I add the fifth thing. Right. The other thing you should realize, if you have to stay on the same note for a while, like, uh, and this is also something Mrs. Talbin said, don't just stay in, in one position, travel a little bit. Travel a little bit. Ortman and Talbin said that travel a little bit up like Dexter asked about should you keep your wrist level all the time you can travel a little bit up a little bit down and it takes away the fatigue you can try it on your own later <laughs> thank you thank you very much Dr. Rita. of course who else has a question I do is that Helen yeah. Helen speak so 
great. And it's good to see you again. Too. Great to see you. You're in Hellertown, PA. <laughs> yeah, exciting here. But I wanted to add, I wondered if you could have some comments on double six. If you had some what? Double six. Six. Like but what was your verb? Um, if you. Right, I'm sorry, to... have trouble hearing your words. Oh, everybody says that to me. I, I'd like you to comment on the motion of double six. Ah, double six. Yes. Moving Again, up. Again, you have to lean toward your thumb. Even if at the concert you want the fifth finger, fourth and fifth fingers to be singing out, when you practice it, you still have to lean toward the thumb. The whole idea is the hand wants to go wants wants to pronate go toward the thumb and you can control and practice that way you go toward the thumb okay, thanks great and then the day before the concert you yes. just switch the emphasis on the fifth finger okay. let the fifth sing out but for control and practice you should go toward the thumb in either hand okay play a few six just a few on play a few <laughs> And then at the concert. Also practice like that, rep repetition. And the other. Thank you, Jim. Yes. I see someone else has a question. Speak up, please. Are there any chat questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, Sunday, tomorrow there are two sessions and there are two separate Zoom invitations. At 10 o'clock, we're hearing teachers Drajika and Nancy, Nancy Modell and Drajika Korczyk are going to teach uh, children. Uh, so you get a sense of how to introduce without these big fancy words of Ortman or even Taubman, you get a sense of uh, the right approach working with children. Like, for example, I remember Mrs. Taubman would say, to keep your arms straight, just pretend there's a little uh, maybe a little creature or a car, a car running across, <laughs> and you don't want you don't want the bear to fall off. Like if you drop your wrist, he's going to fall off. Uh, so you'll hear, yeah, like that, <laughs> like Janet has. Um, so that's at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. At eleven o'clock, Dan Creasy is going to do a jazz class and show important features of how the Talman approach can work for jazz players. Now, if for some reason you don't have the link already, please write to us today at this and we will send you the link. This is the address to write to. Okay, any other questions? Hi, David. Just want to say hi and thank you for a wonderful lesson that I got into. My favorite piece, you know. <laughs> yes, and, hi, uh, Tanya. Very glad to see you. Her. I see likewise, you there in likewise. your room. Thank you yep. for attending and hope to see you tomorrow if you have time. Definitely. I'll do my best to be there as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much again. Okay. I think in chat. There are some comments we'll answer later in chat, but thank you all for your participation and enthusiasm and uh, one day the zoom thing won't be necessary but actually we had 72 people attending today so we're very grateful for that on behalf of sandra and myself we thank you for your atten attention and hope to see you tomorrow thank you thank you thank you so much bye-bye bye everyone bye bye
Can you listen to me? Thank you very much. It was great. Really, absolutely great. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. You're coming from Brazil. Wow. Yes, from Brazil. Great. Glad you attended. Me too. Very much so. Very grateful. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll be in touch. David? Yes. Danny Kelly here. Danny Kelly. Hey, great uh, class you're giving here. And I, I made a comment that relaxation is so important. It's something all of us wrestle with throughout our careers in playing piano. And learning different ways to achieve relaxation is so very, very important. So thank you for what you have put out there. I think it's important and I think it's absolutely necessary. Good to hear Good. You. Well, continue the tradition always. Okay, man. Good. Good to see you. Hope to see you in person one day. Hey, one of these days it's going to be possible. Yeah. Good. Thanks a lot, man. Enjoyed it. Good. Thank you, Danny. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye, David. So, Justin, there you are. I didn't see you before. There you are. You look great. Do I? Nice sweater. <laughs> you, oh, thank you. Um, it's, it's wonderful the way that you're able to assist teachers and pianists uh, at all levels and your ability to articulate something that major names are unable to do. I'm sure you've attended many a master class, which was uh, just fell flat because they would resort to it should sound like this and then they would play when in fact they have no business playing unless there's something they really want to demonstrate. Um, you don't do that, bravo, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm more in the, in the school of uh, figuring out things, you know, I'm not a natural prodigy or anything, but I love studying and love improving. So, well, I've attended many of your performances, as you well know. I hope you know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your the, your performances are masterful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I got to go do chores. It's raining here in the Catskills. Thanks so much. Okay, let's stay in touch, Justin. Good to see you. You too. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Tanya. Okay, we're going to sign off. Have a good day, everyone. See you tomorrow. Likewise. You too. Bye. bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Shishuan. You were great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.